your boy, Flavor Flav, and this is Chris Angel's Talking Junkies. Hey, this is Chris Angel. Welcome to another episode of Talking Junkies. You'll notice that we have no panel here today. We have Tantiana, of course, and we have Darian, our bartender. Now, this episode is special because there was a lot of shit talking going around among myself and the three guests that you're about to meet. Give it up for the kings of gossip. I'm talking Perez Hilton. Yes. Sam Novak. Yes. And Scott Robin. Give it up. Yes. You. Yeah, what's up, guys? Good afternoon. Nice Thank you, you so much for uh, for joining. People are probably shocked that live in Vegas that follow you. Why the hell are you with Chris Angel on the set of Talking Junkies? Wait, Chris, though, you can't do this with your sunglasses on. Oh, of course I can. No, <laughs> we have to make eye contact. Oh, I'm making eye contact. I'm looking right at you. Listen, I am not young player. and beautiful like Darian. Or like Perez or Scott or Sam <laughs> or Tatiana for that matter. I am an older dude and uh, this is something I didn't even shave for the occasion because I'm back to work tomorrow. And, uh, you know, I wanted just to have a real conversation with glasses on. <laughs> and, uh, and, and no, I'm very grateful that you that you came here. Now, it's interesting because this all began with you, Perez. You are truly the guy that really started gossip whether it was positive or negative. And then you have gone through a personal transformation yourself. And we have been good for years. And, uh, you know, we follow each other. You come see my show. Um, I know about your kids. They do magic and I give them the kits and then they kind of give the love back. And it's, it's been a great relationship. But you and I had our differences years ago. Uh, and just to be fully transparent, you came to my show at one point and you hated the I show. I should tell the story. Yeah, oh, please do. Please Because do. it's pretty iconic. Yes. Yes. <laughs> please tell, please tell I the mean, story. I can genuinely laugh about it now because it was in the Paleolithic age. It was forever ago. It was, what year was it? 2009? Around there? Yeah. Or, yeah, it was, or no, it was probably 2008. 2008? Yeah. yeah, 2008. Eight, was, you know, um, I'm very old and you are mature as well. And we have matured. But back in my wilder days, when you were also wild as well, we were both big balls of light. And I thankfully have learned that you should not say everything publicly that you think privately. Uh, some people never learned that lesson, like, like Donald Trump. Uh, you know, um, not a fan. Um, I. Actually, earlier today, I was on uh, a British morning show and they wanted me to talk about wokeism. And I don't like that word, but I do like being mindful of other people. I don't think that anything to an extreme is positive, um, you know, and I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a center dude. But uh, I was definitely extreme when I was younger and I went to see your show and it was um, I think in the extended previews period, you had a very long previews yes, period. We did. Which, and well, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it, which version the of the show was it? The okay. Belief Show, Cirque du Soleil show. Yeah. Okay. And um, there were multiple stops during the show. And I think like the second stop, I'm like, fuck, this is like getting a root canal. <laughs> and I tweeted it. This is like right when Twitter was brand new. And Chris comes out. Uh, on stage after the, the stop and says, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special guest in the audience tonight. Give it up for Perez Hilton, that son of a bitch or whatever, something like that. And in these you, you, you stood up. I gave a beauty I like, stand up, stand up. Yeah, he's the biggest you know? douchebag. I tweeted and I was going, oh, but how did he know? He was on oh, stage. I, my people told me, but this wow. is the thing that's interesting. <laughs> and I'm so happy we can laugh about it. But originally, I remember looking at your website and I used to put pictures of me before you came to see the show. I used to with, doodle with, things. With oh cum stains on my face. Love dots. Yes. <laughs> Love dots. Um, and I don't so, do that anymore. Yeah, no. You know, you know that, that's the thing. And, and so 
we have uh, resolved our differences and we've, you have children, you have three beautiful children and you're an amazing dad. I mean, the way you take care of your children. Can I say second I, to none? I'm truly inspired and grateful that you even are open to or believe in this concept of making amends because just in the last 12 months, I've been shocked at how many people aren't. And, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll get to this more, but I've been shocked living in Las Vegas, how many professional people working in the industry are unprofessional. Right. <laughs> Because Vegas is such a different beast from Los Angeles. Things have been done in Vegas for so long a certain way. And people in positions of power are resistant to change. And it's still an old boys club. And even people that I know know better are afraid to rock the boat. Like it, it, It's why somebody like Steve Wynn remained in power for as long as he did with Everybody knowing all of the things that he did. Uh, so um, well, I'm excited to chat about everything today. I love that subject matter because that's, I, you've, you've distilled Vegas in, into this little precise thing that's so different that a lot of people don't understand. Uh, that culture and the way business is done related to entertainment and PR and journalism. It's a, it's a great uh, subject and it's so true. Well, what I was going to say is life is death without change that I live by that. And I also understand that the past doesn't define who you are in the future or in the present. So it's never too late to change the road you're on, as Led Zeppelin would say. So um, I think that a lot of people that are not open to to rectify and to resolve uh, uh, an outstanding issue are people that believe their own hype that are very uh, much about their ego. And, you know, what I have gone through as a human being with, with my son really transformed my life in so many different ways. And, and when you have children, uh, it changes you. Your son, and, I mean, I'm sure most everybody tuning in now is aware your son had pediatric cancer. Yes. And it was a long process. Over six years. Over he had a relapse. Years. Over six years of chemo for the most part, every single day. And people can watch 1095, a documentary I made. And that's been my life's mission, you know, like right now is to raise money. We raised one point, uh, what is it? 1.4, $1.5 million so far, maybe more this year um, uh, for our community, for Cure for the Kids and Make-A-Wish of Southern Nevada. So, you know, it kind of changes uh, what is important and, and what really matters. But obviously, you know, you have uh, a living to make and celebrities put themselves out there um, and they are able to be a target. And I get that. And, um, you know, the way that this whole thing came about, I think, was my relationship, my friendship with you now. You said to me when uh, Sam from Vital Vegas, uh, rather Scott from he, Vital well, Vegas. Sam's, yeah, he did a video as well. I thought it, was it Sam I, or you I Scott? started it. Sam uh, thought it'd be good for me to do a video response, which I never. Just I, let, let, me, let, let me give a backstory. So <laughs> I am aware of everything. And I saw that Scott tweeted something about you and your show. Do you have it? Do you want to read I it? I do. Oh, I do. So basically. So he saw, uh, he tweeted that. And then yeah, I let's post. Bring up, let's bring up number one, Perry. <laughs> <laughs> but we can just go for back. those who don't know what's going on. Let's just bring them up to speed. So we're going to put yeah, on the, this is the, this is after 10 years of me making, uh, what now seem sometimes a bit, uh, mean spirited jokes at Chris's expense. Are you so, sure you want to say that Scott? No, I, I, I mean, this I one was true. It's a decade. And it, it, I, I, I went back through the, my posts and I've done thousands of posts on, on, uh, the vital Vegas blog. <laughs> and, uh, well, I got to get a plug in. Uh, and I've found all these references to, to Chris and his show unrelated to anything that I was talking about. It was just kind of like this, you know, it, it was just a go to, it was like a running joke, really. Uh, and the, the most recent one was, was the one that caught your well, eye yeah, because I, you're a shit stir now. 
in the fine tradition of shit stirring because you watch not just Vegas, but the Vegas influencer mm-hmm. community. And you realize that in Vegas, it's, there's a lot of feuds and people going after each other. So, so that's the context of this. This is and after it was pretty 10 spicy. years of me being. It was very yeah, so cool. let's, let's pull that, Perry, if you can put that up. Uh, no, I want number one, which is the. Uh, oh, good. God. Basically, he wrote. Uh, <laughs> oh, Jesus. He wrote. Oh, here we go. Yeah, you can read it. Oh, yes. This was how it all uh, began. Uh, so I was talking about the success of, of, of Mind Freak. Whether you want to hear it or not, it's the truth, and I can back it up with the numbers. Oh, boy. But, uh, but we are, even in Caesar's portfolio of all the shows, we are the number one um, show um, nightly. Maybe sometimes we, 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 we're not number one, we're number two, or, but we're within that, that range. And I posted about tickets on sale for the number one show. And then um, Vital Vegas, Scott responded. <laughs> Are you going to read this? <laughs> no, 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 no. This is the number oh. one live show in Vegas. Unless you measure number one by most screaming by oh. a performer. Oof. <laughs> or best scene. at using childhood cancer to oh. trick audiences into giving standing <laughs> ovations. So. So I, I saw that and I posted it yeah, yeah. because, you know, number one, fine. But number two was muy caliente, as they say. And I knew that if I amplified that, <laughs> it would get traction because, you know, people get very amped up when somebody seemingly attacks a child. And I'm not saying that's what you did, but some might perceive it that way. And you know, I am uh, um, somebody who uh, is uh, good at stirring the pot. So I made sure to tag <laughs> Chris, not just post it. Of course. But I tagged yeah. him as well, <laughs> expecting or thinking that he would respond. And he did. Yeah. N- normally, I would never respond because in 10 years, I never responded to you. Right. But everything is a blessing in disguise. A so blessing. my response <laughs> was this. Perez, no need to clap back. As you know, my son battled pediatric cancer for six years, and my goal is to help other kids fighting for their lives. Thanks to my fans, we have donated millions to help kids in our community at Cure for the Kids and Make-A-Wish of Southern Nevada. This past year, this past December 18th, we have raised over $1.6 million, and every cent will go to children in our community. It's sad that some are so miserable that they just (laughs) view hatred and negativity to feel better about their their inadequate lives. I sincerely wish them the best and hope they find love and happiness. Oh, yeah. Regarding my show's success, (laughs) it's obvious it drives the same people crazy as it becomes more and more successful year after year while their faves, unfortunately, keep closing. Loved, hated, never ignored. I'll be here as long as I choose to be. Let them keep talking. Happy New Year, and God bless you and your beautiful family. So that's, that was my response. And that was expertly done because that was a clapback. And I would yeah. say pretty savage. <laughs> that was pretty uh, savage. More, far more <laughs> Chris, did you, did you I've ever that yourself? said. I wrote that myself. 100%. Uh, I swear, I'll, I'll show it. Are you dissing him? You don't think no, he's no, capable I'm, of I'm, writing I'm just, that? No, not at all. I'm just clarifying. Yeah, that no, the I wrote that personally posterity. because, um, you know, I don't care if people say things about me personally. Like, I'm a target. This is what I do for a living. I understand that. But my son went through hell. And uh, I try not to get emotional, but uh, it was a very trying time when you don't know if your kid is going to live or die. And, um, and I don't play around with that. I use my art to express myself. I put my, I wear my heart on my sleeve in my show and I, uh, I don't utilize, um, my son's tragedy or at that time it was a tragedy. Thank God he's great now to enlist anything reactions from people that are positive. I get multiple standing ovations every single show. You pick the day you want to come see the show, see it for yourself. And you'll see, I probably get between three and six standing ovations per show in the middle of the show. Um, and that's because we worked our asses off. So listen, I, I, I understand this. But the good news is, is that this, then I started to think, you know what? I, 
I feel as if it's important because we live in a world today where people hide behind keyboards and people, kids get bullied and all of these things happen. I said, you know what? I'm going to reach out to you and see if you could broker a meal that we can all have together because it's very easy to talk about somebody you don't know. But maybe if you know me and I get to know you, we can understand. We might not agree, but at least appreciate the different perspectives. And maybe we can come together and realize that, you know what? What you think somebody's like might not be. And everyone has emotions and feelings. And, um, you know, you, um, in, in, a, in a fun way, you know, called yourself a troll when you were with me. <laughs> you said, I'm a troll. I am a this, I'm a that. And, and you know, I'm just curious. And, and, and here's what I want to know. And I say this with all sincerity, and I'm not here to belittle anyone. You make a living, you make a living, you all make a living doing what you do. But my question is, is how does, like, how does it feel to meet somebody, myself, when you've talked so much shit about somebody you don't know, and then you know me, does it, does it matter or does it have an effect? Is, is it something that you kind of reflect on and think about, or do you just kind of push forward and not even consider maybe the uh, ramifications that it might have in somebody's life or their kids or anything like that? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a, it, it's a kind of like a, it could be a white paper on the, the reality of social media and in, in my world of humor, of comedy, because there is a, there's definitely been a shift to things getting snarkier. Mm -hmm. um, and in my world, my, I, I don't even really consider my site to be anything but like a humor site about Las Vegas and Las Vegas related things. Um, I do agree that it took us getting together for me to see myself as a troll because I spend a lot of time on my podcast complaining about trolls. Uh, it actually has given, it's given me a ton of anxiety dealing with trolls because they're obsessive and unrelenting. I think in my world, I just have always separated and you, you might be able to speak to this because of your pat, your kind of world of celebrity kind of. Uh, you know, I consider someone who's rich and famous to just be impervious to anything some stupid blogger or Twitter account is going to say. So in my world, I like I don't there's no element of anything I do where I'm I'm I'm, you know, thinking seriously about cancer. You know, I wish cigar smokers cancer. I, t I tweeted that I'm like <laughs> cigar cancer for cigar smokers is not happening fast enough. So I deal, there's no subject that's off limits. There's no subject that I, you know, that I will not use for, for the sake of comedy, but having met you and heard more about kind of these things where they've been rumors. I've shared some, I've heard some, I've, there's a lot I've heard that I haven't shared. I'd love to ask you about, um, <laughs> but, but I, it's, it's kind of like, it takes the fun out of, takes the fun out of it. Like now I have to find a different go-to punching bag, I guess, because it's, but in the world of celebrities, it's like Dolly Parton's big boobs. Like nobody's going to walk up to Dolly Parton and go, you know, your boobs are really big and make jokes about it. But for, you know, for 20 years, Dolly Parton's big boobs were a thing that people made jokes about. So it's, it's kind of like there's different ways of viewing the world. Some of them are very serious and meaningful and deep. Wait, wait, something very important just has happened. Sam's getting another drink. <laughs> yes. Sorry, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, uh, Scott. And Thank I feel so like I'm shrinking. But, in, but, in real but Scott, time, my but Scott, I guess, I guess, I guess my question for you is when you get troll and you told me, you know, off camera, we, we, we talk, let's face it, we text each other. We have, I, I'd like to think, a, a decent relationship. And, and you've been very candid and you've been very vulnerable with me, uh, telling me like, you know, I, about your personal life, which I won't get into, but you've expressed to me that you've had people troll you and you've been in situations and, you know, and so how does that feel to you to basically, you, you might bitch about trolling, but then you will troll. 
Yeah, it's, I think the word is hypocrisy or hip- <laughs> being hypocritical, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. I don't know. I I've tend to view, because I've always done humor, so I just don't take anything really very seriously. And my bread and butter is snark. Yeah. My bread and butter is humor because there's a, there's 50 news outlets in Vegas. Nobody gives a shit. But when someone but like when there's a joke right. involved, that makes people pay attention. And, and so levity and making fun of things is it's horrible. I know it's horrible. I know social media can be horrible, mm-hmm. but that's what I do all day. And I'm one of the best at it. Like, so, so let me ask you this of things specifically is skill. So when somebody questions your integrity or what you do and, and somebody, and, and it upsets you, like as an example, uh, John Katz, who's a local, uh, uh, would you say gossiper? Uh, no, 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 no. He's right. He's, he's considered an entertainment journalist. Okay. Yeah, but in quotation but, marks, journalist. Well, technically, that would be where, what he falls under. Yeah, uh, yeah. He, That's what he thinks of so himself. So basically, uh, you're in this post, you're basically accusing John Katz of plagiarism. Yes. Right? So here it is. Um, you're going back and forth. Uh, Which is a recurring theme. That's something that Scott does all the time. Uh, allege that. Right. Yeah. So, so does it piss you off that that you feel like he lifts your stories because you put all the time and you get the story and then somebody just takes it. Does it annoy you? That is a yes. And then he outright trolled me. Like he said something the trolls say, because as, as you were saying, one of the things that gets me riled up is when people say I'm being paid uh, by casinos or restaurants to give a, give a review, a positive. I've never done it. So the trolls are out there. The, the really serious obsessive ones are out there every day posting every time I post a picture of a chicken sandwich, it's like he's being paid to promote this. It's never been true. Johnny Katz decides in one of his, uh, one of his posts to take an unflattering photo of me. This is, the, this is an entertainment journalist at the paper of record. He posts a picture of me from behind without my permission, consent, not a big deal. But then he goes, this is Circa's guy. Circa's guy. Because the trolls say I work for Circa. So this is a guy who pr- pretends to be a journalist, is trolling me. And yeah, I'm pissed. We, that was a, it's open warfare now. I never call him uh, Johnny Castlemedes. Now I call him Johnny Kleptomedes <laughs> because he's been stealing my stuff for a decade. Uh, and yes, it's upsetting. So that, it is hypocritical because I'm accusing him of trolling and theft and, and co- compromises of his integrity. And when people do it to me, I don't like it, but isn't that how life works? Well, that, that's, that's, that's my point. point. That, this is where I'm, go- this is what I'm going, <laughs> uh, going after here because I, I don't know if you guys talk to shrinks or psychologists or, or get time in to kind of go through this because for me, it's kind of like, it, it's kind of a situation where a decade went by where you were doing this stuff. And, and I never responded. It took the cancer component for me to like, be like, okay, you crossed the line. I'm going to put an end to it because I have a pretty thick skin and I try to take the high road for the most, most of the times, every time, except that time. And in (laughs) the Perez time, which was many years ago. But so my point is how come you don't, basically take the high road and let him do what he's doing and then basically not allow it to bother you when you don't expect it to bother celebrities when you do it to them? Yeah, that's, these are great questions. <laughs> okay, can I offer a I don't need possible therapy. answer to that myself? Angel. <laughs> yes. Um, I think that the situation there is that he's just not laying it that in the direction of Scott, but there are a number of us in this field who are getting that from who would be considered a very stoic, so-called professional um, journalist who's supposed to abide by a certain um, mode of behavior. So you're telling me that you have issues? Absolutely. With, uh, with he, John Cat? Yes. Come on. Um, he called me up just this past week. Um, <laughs> oh my God, sorry, John. <laughs> oh, this is a good I mean, one. Wait, he, well, he bounces I mean, on my uh, Facebook page, <laughs> page no, uh, on a semi-irregular basis, um, throwing blatant digs at my integrity, um, the source of my employment, uh, the, the, the number of people that are on my team, 
um, whether or not. So I what wrote, happened this past week specifically? Um, I was writing an article. I, I published an article about this show called Follies. It's a Stephen Sondheim musical that's taking place in April at uh, the Alianti Casino. And I have a very troubled uh, re- relationship with the three producers of that show. And um, my, my concern in write, my, the motivation for writing my article was whether or not this enormous cast, which consists of about 70 singers, dancers, actors, wow, and other huge. kinds of performers, along with an orchestra of 30 people, are going to get paid. Because I know a, a number of them that are in this cast. I respect them greatly. And to have such a high ticket show in a very remote area is, is, a, is already a, a number of warning flags. Um, the, the scale that they're putting this thing out is something that would be daring in a strip casino. And this is way off the beaten path. So I wrote this article expressing my concern, give a background story on the people that are behind this show. And then I also broke down the mathematics, the pricing, the, the number of seats in the venue, and, and detailed all that out. The, the thing that I said was most disconcerting about the whole situation was the fact that John Castellanides had put two articles about the show in the Review Journal, neither of which discussed all of these concerns. Um, my suggestion, it wasn't an, ac- an accusation of any kind of Um, getting paid off or anything of that nature was the simple fact that he had written these, what I would consider to be promotional pieces, but never once discussed the troubled history of the people behind the production, not mentioning the fact that when they owned a supper club, that there was the Johnny Katz booth with a plaque that he could come into and sit down anytime and watch a show, have what I would assume to be free meals, free drinks. I mean, he, he does not drink. He's known as uh, uh, being in recovery. So, but he had carte blanche to walk in this place at any time. The, the final element that I threw into this was the fact that his longtime girlfriend is a performer in that show, which was also not mentioned. Hmm. Um, if you're working for a major newspaper, you would think that things like that that might come into question about your own intentions in writing an article would be disclosed or perhaps even recuse so yourself. So what happened? You wrote this, you released and this I mentioned, on I, Vegas 411. Correct. And then lo and behold. The next thing I know, I'm, I'm getting a phone call from him. <laughs> now, in all fairness, I, I published this article while I was in the midst of a very severe cold. I was in and out of sleep. He mm. called while I was asleep. Um, now, I had run this article past the owner of the website, I ran it past our attorney to make sure that there was no um, concerns of slander or, or anything of that nature. And everything that I put in there either had links to documentable facts or backgrounds that would make it known that I was not necessarily just throwing barbs out there. And none of them were tossed specifically at uh, John, aside from the fact that He's promoting a show that he might have, you know, some emotional or mm. financial or personal connections to. Yeah. Um, I always get curious when, when a journalist um, will write reviews about shows, but will not review certain shows. Um, he's been accused of that as well. And the only other time that I specifically mentioned him in an article of mine was something that was involving the Las Vegas Symphony Orchestra. The owner of the orchestra contacted me, frustrated that he could never get Johnny to come see the orchestra or write anything about it. Um, So I told him that I would look into this. I reached out to Johnny and asked him if he'd be willing to make a statement. Mm -hmm. And just for the record, to make sure that everything was documented, I told him that I would only communicate back and forth with him through email. Hmm. Phone conversations can be hearsay. There's no proof that I might miss. Right, you him. want a paper trail. I want a paper trail. Absolutely. Right. My phone was ringing. Right. I was getting texts. And I, I, and I said to him, Johnny, I cannot express this enough. I want this in writing. I don't want to be accused. Right. He didn't want <laughs> to put it in you. Write it. Yeah. He <laughs> called up my husband, who's a doctor in another state trying to reach me through him. And I, I get a call back from my husband saying, why the hell 
Am I seeing patients in Oregon and getting a call from Johnny Katz while it's, I'm doing it's, office hours? It's unbelievable because Vegas is the entertainment capital of the world. And then Thank you have you. what Paul E. C. and this that you've been writing about. So there's a lot of conflict. Is it because like if well, I go up to somebody on the street and I say name five magicians, they struggle with naming five magicians in the world. Is it because everybody's fighting for the same story and then you release the story first, you do all the legwork, and then somebody basically is taking all of your work and putting you know, it out there as if it's their own? A few things. First of all, I'm not one to bite my tongue. And <laughs> I would like to state for the record that I do like John Katsilamidis. Uh, I, I like him as a person. I also don't view him as a news reporter. That's not what he does. He does entertainment. He has a column. It's like man on the street. Uh, I don't think he needs to disclose that his girlfriend's in that show personally, but that's just me. I, I, I don't work for the newspaper. I, I do my own thing. I'm my own boss. To play devil's advocate, somebody watching or listening right now might say two things. First, you know, maybe John doesn't, Pay attention to what you're writing. Does it know that you had a scoop on something? And to him, it, it is his scoop. Just saying, you know, somebody would need to be reading you and what you're posting every single day to know that you wrote about it first. That's just one thing. And then the second devil's advocate moment is how would you respond if somebody says, well, gosh, the two of you are sounding like bitter Bettys that are jealous of him and what he has. I'm not saying that I believe yeah, no, that. Go ahead, go ahead, so Scott, respond. I'm not saying I believe that. This is great. I'm just, you guys I'm just saying, on great you on each other. I'm just saying like some watching. people might think that. <laughs> no, these are great questions. So as I mentioned, this is 10 years of him taking my stories. He doesn't have to see it. The editors at the Las Vegas Review Journal assign my tweets to writers, whether it's a food writer, a business writer, Johnny Katz. They walk the tweets over and go, this is your assignment. Many times I will, ta now I'll tag Johnny Katz in a, in a story that I break. So there's literally no way he can say and he hasn't that blocked he hasn't you? seen it. Uh, no, we've gone from blocking on blocking. We're frenemies too. Like we're friendly. Even now that I call him Johnny Kleptomedes, he hates it uh, <laughs> because he thinks I'm making fun of his family name. Uh, I'm not, I'm making fun of him for stealing my stuff for 10 years. But he, so uh, that's, a, that's a valid question, though. Jealousy is a definite component, but that has to do with how he is treated disproportionately to his actual reach. Mm. Uh, he's never gotten more than 10 likes on a tweet. Uh, he, is, he walks into a media event. We went to Awakening, and we've been there 10 minutes. We're... we're I thought it was right. nice we that all, we were even invited. Because we all we have like, designated meeting times to uh, uh, talk with the producers and so forth. And it was a very structured element. Are you going to? Yeah. So Kat breezes in after we've been there 15 minutes. He breezes in and literally everyone in the show bends over. Like he, they were, they are on their knees praising his presence. 14 people read his stories. My mother canceled the review journal because she's, she thinks he's boring and he steals my stuff. So, but it's, <laughs> but it's not even about reach, right? It's all about they can put the Las Vegas Review Journal said this in marketing materials, whereas people know that brand. They may not know Vital Vegas. They may not know Vegas 411. So it's not even about the eyeballs. It's about the cachet. It's about the prestige that's associated with the Las Vegas Review Journal. And right? they've so taken my, that for yeah. in, the, in the marketing for Awakening, at least in round one. Um, I, you actually didn't bring up what I thought you were going to bring up was that you, you, you described it as everybody bending over. I got the opposite impression of him walking in the door late saying, and he, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is exactly what he said. He said, okay, we can get started now. As if we were all waiting for him and, <laughs> and not colleagues. Yeah. And then he breathes and, right and, by and us. And I was we like, are you kidding me? You're late. We've already begun. Nobody's waiting for you. Yeah. So it is, it is, I think it has to do with my job is to take it, take it down. Because you're right. The Review Journal has traditionally been kind of the, but that I don't think is true anymore. But my, you, you, you have far more followers on your Vital Vegas. More than subscribers to the Las Vegas Review Journal. <laughs> I, have, I have more followers by 
probably a good 25,000. Right. So, and it's millions of impressions. Yeah. And so it's not really jealousy. It's more kind of like you want to just shake, you want to shake the PRs because the, the subject it's you brought up about the PRs, is, I think it's, yeah. you know, the PR people probably get it. It's the higher up. It's the people that the PR folks report to who maybe are older or don't understand how things work. You know, I had one PR person. This was the, the craziest part. Didn't even tell me directly that they were mad at me. They told a friend of mine. <laughs> I'm like, are we in freaking high school? <laughs> yes. Uh, so that's then, Vegas. That, then that's word got back to me. I'm like, was. all right, well, I don't, I, the two things that they could possibly be upset about, like it's ridiculous to be upset about them, but it, we didn't even mention this. So Chris reached out to me to broker this dinner and we all met up and we had a wonderful dinner. And after that dinner that we all had, that inspired me to try to make amends myself with other people. So I reached oh, out to this, this one publicist didn't even fucking respond to my email. Can you say who or no? I'm not going to say who. Oh, I'm learning, learning my man. lessons. Yeah. But let me tell you, you did learn your lesson because you look, I've never seen you look so fabulous. Oh, thank you. Let me just stand up and let me just see that sweater you got on. That is fantastic. <laughs> what did you do? Look at that. Oh. Look at that. My goodness. Hey, that's look a- at that. That is, so. It's very comfortable. Mine so, has a bad word on it. I couldn't even wear it. My mind <sighs> freak. Did, didn't it say not, the F word in it? Mind oh, freak. That's right. I didn't get any. I any thought it said uh, paraphernalia. Wait, wait, mind freak. I have a shirt that says mind fuck, but I didn't give you that one. That's the one I got. I gave you that sweater. I can't wear that with, with my mom. No, I didn't give my you mom. that sweater. I, I had to walk it. into my mom's house. It would give her a heart attack. Well, I had to did your mom ever it. read your post of what you wrote about <laughs> me? Probably <laughs> give her two heart attacks. <laughs> yeah, wait, I, I want a young man. I want to like... Um, Reveal a secret. Oh, we all right. Ooh, Exclusively, lean in here. we're here talking junkies. Perez is going to reveal a secret. I don't know if your regular audience is aware of this, but it's a secret about you. Oh, okay. or maybe it's not a secret. Maybe they know this. I just think when I saw this, I'm like, wow, I love that. You employ not one, but two of your cousins. I do. And they work for you. Yeah. And they're I, here. I yeah. love that. I, I, I try to, uh, listen, I, Tantiana has been with me for 15 years. Is she years. a cousin as well? No. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> she married one of the cousins? No, no. But here's the thing. I consider everybody because we like people that work with me have been with me for a decade, uh, two decades. Like, you know, Tommy's what, 20 years. Like I consider it family. I have a huge sense of responsibility to take care of those that take care of me. And I have probably, I don't know, what do I have? 75, 80 people that I'm responsible for a week. Wow. So, um, you know, like I, I consider everybody, whether they're my blood cousin or, or Tantiana, like I have a sense of responsibility because like I could never be successful. I'm only you know, I, I'm, the, the picture can't be made unless you have great pieces for the puzzle. Like I looked at Vital Vegas, you know, I look at, you know, what you put out there and the sheer volume and what you guys do is just crazy. Like how many posts a day do you put out? It's, it's literally crazy. 10. Because I always look at you and go, he's just a workaholic. And then I realize my day is 20 hours a day of that crap. So it's just like being differently obsessed, but you, know, you, have, you can't do it half. You can't do it halfway. Yeah, but that's You're the either thing. Do it. It's like fully the or attention not. span of people today is like drastically different than three, five, ten years ago. Back in the day, you could do a magic special and you could show one continuous shot the whole time. If you did that today, people would flip the channel. It's like you have to hold their attention span because people are you know, so immersed with technology that their brain and the way they process information, kids, it's like this, they're like gnats. And it's like, you got to put out that much content in order to keep people engaged. Because if you just put one thing out a day. Well, you'll you'll be punished on social media. It's it's about, it's kind of like Vegas also, you know, like in a big change, at least for me over the last few years is, all of the platforms are prioritizing video content. And, you know, you could spend a long time working on a video and it'll get no views. 
but then you might make a stupid video yeah. really quickly and that'll get a ton of views. So it's just about volume, right? Volume, you, volume, you volume. It's like gambling. Have, the more you gamble, you even the, the better have your one handle. You have multiple handles, multiple platforms. Yes. How, how and, uh, and why? Well, uh, you know, I started my Vegas specific account, Las Vegas Perez. Uh, and I have a podcast too, since Scott was plugging everything, PerezPodcast.com. <laughs> uh, I started Las Vegas Perez just because I thought, you know what? I'm a, I'm a business, per- you're a business person. You're a very smart business person. We're in a large ass studio that you own. And there's another studio across the street that you also own. Uh, so I thought, you know, there is, and this is a good lesson also if somebody's listening or watching that wants to start doing something. It doesn't even need to be social media. Like if you want to be a magician, you know, you're, you're already established, but, and I'm not a magician, obviously, but if I were to give an up and coming magician advice is like, find a way to do magic or do whatever it is that you do differently than people before you have done it. You need to find your, your niche. Celebrate who you are. Because also now, the more niche you are, the more profitable it can be. Mm-hmm. So I thought, you know what? Instead of just sharing my Vegas stuff that I'm doing in my regular accounts, go niche and just do a Vegas-specific account because I could monetize that perhaps even more so than like muddying it with my other content. Um, but yeah, you know, for me, I am a business person, but it's also organic. I'm not I don't have five year plans or three year plans or anything like that. I'm just. But you've done well, really well for yourself because you were like the leader. You were creating the path. And then, you know, everybody followed what your. Well, social media didn't even exist when I started. I'm I'm that old. It was your website. (laughs) Uh, You know, it's crazy for me to think that I've been doing it now since 2004. And I'm just grateful that I'm still here. And. I owe a lot of that just to my, as I'm sure as as Scott himself said, and and you also an unhealthy work ethic, right? An obsessive work ethic. There is no writing on coach. I mean, look at Jennifer Lopez still three plus decades into her career. She busts her butt. And that's what you need to do. If you don't, if, if you want to not just achieve success, but sustain it, you know, Social media and the way the world works now, you might be able to luck your way into success, but you won't hold on to that if you're lazy. You've got to put in the work and well, continue to put in the work. That's the thing. You know, they say uh, Bill Coin, a very famous manager of Kiss and Billy Idol, Billy Squire, told me one time when I was really depressed, he said, this is the best days of your life. I was like, what do you mean? He said, the journey is far greater than the destination. And I was like, I don't know what, what this means. He said, trust me, you're going to be successful and, and it's going to be harder to remain the most successful at your craft, to remain the most relevant takes more work than being on this journey right now to try to make it. I didn't get it, but it really does. The commitment that you have to make, I mean, Sam, like to do what you do, to do what you do, Scott and Perez, to do what you do. It's like, everybody's out there like, oh, look, 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 Sam's doing this. He's doing this. He's doing this. I could do that. And you have a target on your head, right? And that's why you feel the way you feel because, you know, you make a living. This is how you pay your bills, right? You you don't have another source of income, right? This is it, Scott, right? This is it. This is it. So you, you gotta, you gotta be out there and, and do it in a way that, you know, is always fresh, innovative. And kind of, you probably have to kind of reinvent yourself too. Like you have physically, you had a transformation, you change and turn the corner with not being like mean spirited with, with it, but still, still engaging and stirring shit up, you know? Um, and you've done, and, and by the way, TMZ, I think has done the same thing to some degree. They kind of reinvented themselves a bit. They're not as uh, aggressive as, as they were in the beginning, I think they're a little bit different. And, 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 and Sam, uh, I, I think probably the same thing could be said about you because you've gone through a lot of different transitions and, and different things that, that you were doing that now is, you, you always say to me, like, I'm, I'm somebody who is very methodical. I, I plan stuff out. I'm, 
I take it very serious. It's not I, like I, I think it's interesting though that every one of us has been drawn here to this city in particular because of the uniqueness of a what it brings out of us and b what we can put back into it. Every single one of us has created either deliberately or inadvertently an image to go along with our our profession, what we do, say in writing or on a podcast or on on a video cast. Um, you, you, for instance, you're, you're being a magician, you were a trendsetter in the fact that you were a lot about your look and your, your style along with the magic that you did and your, your personification, your, your verbalization, the, the music, everything was about the, the, the look it, yeah. to, to add to the element mm-hmm. of magic. Um, and, and here in Vegas, there's always that, that sexy element, which interestingly enough gets downplayed um, when it comes to men and Darian and I, Darian and I had this conversation driving over here about how we you drove very, over here together. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, can, can we have Darian on camera? Yes. Come on, go, <laughs> go sit on Sam's lap. It's okay. Go, ahead. <laughs> go, ahead. go sit on his lap. They'll, they'll appreciate it. I think it's on time for the unveiling. Don't oh, you, you want to, you can oh unveil God. it if you'd like. <laughs> oh, Hi. Adios. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Boom. So yeah, this is this is what we're talking about here. We had this conversation about the mm. fact that uh, men, even in Las Vegas, kind of conceal what they have going on. You, on the flip side, you did a lot of topless uh, advertisements, uh, videos, whole shows. Yeah, um, which is completely out of what's the norm for what you do. Right. Um, Darian is a very educated, worldly fellow. But he recognizes the fact that he can sell what he's got to offer because he looks like this. There's- I actually, I talked to my ex uh, and told her about that we had met. And she goes, yeah, one of his big selling points was he was, he's attractive. And that never occurred to me. That's important in <laughs> this wow. city. Let me ask you, what's the dirt in Vegas? Like, you know, what's going on? Because, you know, in, in, in California, you're always getting all this information. Vegas, it's a bit more challenging because it's private property. The casinos, you can't go there and be a paparazzi, right? There's more security probably. But like, what's going on? What's the dirt? Give us the greatest gossip that you can give us right now. I'll throw something out there. Please. Um, over at the Venetian, there's a new venue coming in, which is going to be the antithesis of Voltaire. Voltaire, if you happen to uh, see the articles that I wrote about, and, and Perez and I have talked about this at length, Perez is what I call the ultimate gouge. Um, to 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 a, attend a headliner show at Voltaire, you buy your ticket and then you're on the hook for hundreds and hundreds of dollars of mandatory food and beverage service, which is then taxed, service charged, and feed on top of that. So on top of your ticket, you might be being paid individually five to seven hundred dollars mandatory. And how's the experience? Um, it's not in my budget, so I can't tell you. Perez has been there a few times. Um, in all fairness, as a guest, the, well, yeah, times. I wasn't invited by the venue or the casino. That's right. fine. I, I, I actually, it's a funny story. Do you remember this went viral last year at a Miranda Lambert concert? She reprimanded these yes, fans. They were taking photos. Yeah, the video. I saw that. That woman who Miranda Lambert reprimanded has become a friend of mine. And she's the one that's invited me to Voltaire because she's a baller and she goes to see everything. (laughs) And um, I'm so grateful because she took me to see Kylie Minogue and Christina Aguilera. Scrumptious theater. And I really like the pre-show, the Belle de Nuit, um, which is, you know, cabaret, burlesque, sexy, fun. I am a huge Kylie Minogue fan. That show is spectacular. It's a small venue, right? It it's is. intimate. It's I want to go see 1100, it. 1100 is the capacity around there. I'm going to go see that. Uh, you have cr- a contact there? No. Right. I've only one guest one. I'll get a contact. Yeah. Okay, Take me you, with you. If you get a contact, I mean, when I tell you that I've gone above and beyond to try to get, look at this, this is great. Yeah. Above and beyond to try <laughs> to get in there. Um, I have contacted the Voltaire organization. I've contacted the PR firm that represents them. I've contacted the entertainment group at Venetian. They have zero interest in giving any kind of media access. 
mm. to um, people in the media here in Las Vegas. So I will have to go see that. No, we, to get I'm sorry, we, we, before we release this. <laughs> <laughs> we are all going Vegas to be gone, Mr. Angel. Guilty by association. But it's, yeah. it's all about access and it, that really ties into it, a lot of things that we've already talked about and, and this idea of, if you're not going to say what they want you to say, you just, you're blacklisted. And that basically. brings us into a certain individual that we talked about earlier who is brought in quite frequently just so they can get that positive press. Basically, you're saying people pay favorites. Oh, it's basically percent. what you're saying. Yeah, a thousand percent. I have yeah. a question for you. I didn't get to see a Mystica. Um, can we discuss why? Uh, of course, we could discuss. Um, First of all, a Mystica, um, you know, I, I was such a huge fan of Franco Dragon um, since the 80s when I first saw his work on HBO on a, on a special of a uh, production. And I, I loved Kidam and all these shows that he did and uh, always wanted to work with him and, and, and uh, was under this impression of like, oh, if I could just get with Cirque, you know, then it would be something completely unique. I didn't realize that that getting with Cirque back in 2000 and what was it, eight, when we opened up, I uh, believe, uh, was the worst thing that ever happened to me and the best thing that ever happened to me because I learned it was, it was 10 plus years or 13 years, whatever it was, of really understanding what to do and what not to do. And I didn't get to work with Franco back then for my show, which uh, I was very sad about. Uh, but, but Franco was a guy who uh, I worked on La Rev with. Um, I interviewed him. We had a great respect for one another. Um, he would come see Mind Freak all the time. He was absolutely um, in love with the show. You know, the things that he said to me as a performer, things that he said to me about the show were the greatest compliments that I ever received in my life. And he didn't say it because he had to. He said it because he, he believed that. And then he was like, let's do some productions together. So we were slated to do three productions together. Uh, a Mystica being the first one. And a Mystica um, was, we, we, we marketed it we marketed it the wrong way. Uh, for one, I, I should have never uh, been in that show for five minutes in the beginning. I should have stayed away out of it. But, but when you're trying to set, when you're trying to create a path, you're not following a formula. You're creating something and you make mistakes. And uh, the creative on the show was something that was incredible. Uh, we did it in, for Cirque du Soleil standards in record time, literally put that show together. And I believe it was what, about six months or uh, in that world, which for Cirque du Soleil would take three years to do something and cost a hundred, $200 million historically. So we did this as a passion project and we were gonna open it up for a period of time and then we had plans that we were going to uh, sell the show because we had markets overseas that really wanted this show and other shows that we were going to create. And uh, so Franco and I were working on it. We do a thing called Lions Den, and we went through that whole process. Um, I know that you wanted to come see the show after the fact that you wanted to come see the show. Now, Caesars as a whole has their own standards and practices that they, that they use. And I understand that you came to the show, you bought a ticket, but then you weren't allowed into the show. I was removed from my seat. You were removed from your seat. By two armed security guards <laughs> and the head of right. entertainment for Planet Hollywood. Juicy. Right. You sure it wasn't uh, Darian? Um, no, I, I would have stuck around if it was Darian. But, uh, but the, th the thing was, is I didn't know about that. And I know that you blamed my camera. I did. Um, because I was told by somebody else who had been to the show several times previously in that window that Mike scoped the audience to get, get, gauge it. And he and I knew each other. 
Ian and I had discussions about my conflicts with you. Right. So it, it was a logical conclusion when I was told by somebody else that Mike was involved in having me removed that I believed it. Right. Well, I can assure you, I know Mike like a brother from another mother. He did not have you removed. And I can also tell you that many times, and Tantiana will tell you the truth, I wasn't even in the audience. I wasn't even at the show. There was a period of time that I went home right after my show, Mind Freak. You, you were because, there that, that, that night because I specifically came because it was in the period where you were doing, I think, two weeks oh, of it. And I came because I wanted to, yeah. A, review the show, and B, see you in it. Sam, you could come to my show anytime you wish. Unfortunately, if a Mystica, because Franco passed away, and uh, I closed it literally weeks right after he passed away um, for many reasons. But uh, A Mystica is a show that, that I still get asked about. I get asked in other countries if, if it's for sale because it was Franco's last piece of work. And I had the honor and the pleasure to work with him. We had two other shows we were working on that we were going to do for um, two other countries. But uh, unfortunately, none of that happened. But I'm sorry that you were ultimately the buck stops here. I take responsibility. But I didn't get you kicked out. My camera didn't get, kick, get you kicked out. But I'm sure that casinos, you're probably aware of this, um, have a list of people. <laughs> that they might not welcome I'm into a show. <laughs> I'm on all the lists. What's that? I'm on all oh, you the lists. So, so yeah. I would assume that's probably what happened. It's, it's unfortunate because in, in our profession, I mean, I consider myself an entertainment critic m more than anything else, although I am an entertainment journalist. I, I cover a lot of different things. And as a fan, I genuinely came to that show eager to see it uh, with an open mind. I was excited. I brought seven friends with me. And I was there to see the show. And it's one of my entertainment regrets is that I didn't get to experience it live. Did I, the rest I, of the folks enjoy it? They all stayed. Uh, they, <laughs> they asked if they, if they should oh. go along. And I'm like, nope. Just that kind of videos of me being is glorious. escorted out. Yeah. You glorious. see, I, I think you probably had a bit of a history, probably, you know, talking shit about me or something oh, like absolutely. that. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> so... <laughs> Why, probably from the, the perspective of the hotel, when we're launching something new, do we need somebody to come there that maybe the well, perspective that's, that's perception a slippery slope. might not be that you have an open mind because you're writing stuff that might be stuff that's not well, based in We've already facts. discussed the fact that <laughs> we, we try to keep open minds and, and, and be fair. And I do not go into anything with preconceived notions. Right, but how, how, is, the, how is the hotel going to know that? It, it behooves the hotel to express the same sentiment and hope that they're going to get a fair review. I'm a professional. But, but, but hear me out, Sam. Here's the thing you have to think about, right? So think about this. this your darling show, Peep Show, that you raved about, <laughs> right? You raved about this show, how great it was when you went there to see it. All of these shows, Lion King, right? All of these shows um, that had opened that were the darling shows to critics and to, to people that, you know, do, do what you guys do. Influencers love them. But then you have a history of saying something or many, many, many things about an artist or a, a, about somebody that you hadn't seen the show and you hadn't done these things. It's crazy to me because everybody said in the beginning when I was doing Believe at, with Cirque du Soleil at the Luxor, oh, Chris Angel's a drug addict. It was on the front cover of one of the local papers that this show is not going to last six months. He won't even show up. He's not responsible. Oh, these shows are so much better. Oh, blah, blah, blah. All of this stuff. But somehow, some way, all of those shows closed. I'm still fucking doing it night after night. And I will do it as long as I choose to do it because of the success that we work so hard to achieve. So I think the hotel is probably 
somewhat guarded as some of the other hotels are that just opened and wouldn't let certain people go on their property, right? Who wrote about that? Yeah, I did, talked about it. Yeah, it's, it's right. uh, it was a fountain, very common. The Fountain Blue. Yeah, I was There was a guy that was going the, on there and he got kicked <laughs> off the property. Yeah, he should have been. But I should have been invited to the, to the uh, mm-hmm. opening party. Of which Any, one? Of Fountain Blue. Oh, okay. Uh, it but you weren't? Been, well, a- I bullied them into it because I said, you, this is setting a precedent that you're not going to like because people in social are not going to be supportive moving forward if you snub them because you're having a birthday party for your CEO. So uh, they gave me an invite like two days before. It was too late. I don't own a tuxedo, so it was too late. But it's but what you're talking about is it's an interesting part of Vegas, this idea of access and being considered hostile media. Because I went on uh, I went on KNPR, the local uh, public radio station, and I I said something about Mariah Carey's show not doing particularly well. Caesars pulled a quarter million dollars in financial support for KNPR and said if they ever had me back on again. Mm. They would do it again. And so I've never been invited back on because I, and it wasn't even really controversial. I've been blacklisted at Caesars since I said Britney Spears might lip sync. (laughs) I tweeted that as a joke and I have, they had a meeting the next day. Hostile media is no longer invited to restaurant openings, any show ever. And I've never had. Right. So So this is something inherent in the industry in Vegas. So it's not like, I uh, was, uh, you know, a unique situation. Well, it's, it's something that we've all faced, and, and, yeah. and Perez and I have discussed it, Scott and I have discussed it. Um, now that you're delving into media by way of your podcast and so forth, you're not going to face the same type of scrutiny that the three of us do because you're already on that side looking in, sort of. Yeah. Or vice versa. Well, I, I think, I think, listen, uh, we live in a very unique time, right? Because, it, you know, opinions are like assholes. Everyone has one. <laughs> and so, you know. But, I, but when you're prevented from giving your opinion, you, you are but the, maybe the there's a doing press, that. Maybe there's a precedent that you set. Uh, in all fairness, in, the, in, the, the, in, the previous thing that I wrote about that, you. That people look at history to look at the future. So if you're writing shit about one hotel constantly and then they're having a big party, of course, they're not going to invite you because he's like, what's going to be different? He's going to sit there and mock Talk and we're going to sit there and, and invite him into this wonderful thing that we're spending how much money to do. And then he's going to talk shit. Why do we want some, yeah. that energy? And I think Chris, I can understand that. The though. one published article that I had previous to that incident mm-hmm. was extremely favorable on your account. On me, for me, on, yes. Oh, I gotta see That's this. That's weird. This is. It wasn't weird. You and <laughs> I were see, here. even even your Scott, 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 you and I attended this uh, together. What? It was it, it, the the gist of the thing that I wrote was um, where you were opening up your personality and and yourself when you relaunched Believe is Mind Freak Live, oh, okay. and my article was Chris Angel turns over a new leaf. You would talk oh. to the audience, which was mostly industry professionals asking us to put bygones aside and judge the show on what we were seeing that day. Right. I detailed all of that. Well, that's with an beautiful. Open mind. Yeah, and, and you know what? I, I respect that. And I think that's awesome. But you have to understand that's a unique quality that you possess because a lot of people, and I won't get into name dropping right now, but I've had experiences since I started in Vegas that uh that that was not well, the that, sentiment I'm I, that's something that i've like striven to, to achieve right. basically you're and and you know what nobody nobody has to invite anybody nobody has to let anybody in if if there's somebody that you think is hostile to you or isn't going to like your show why would you let them in you know i'm a big fan of like you know, when you're, you're, I don't know if it was you or your people, you blocked me on Twitter, probably <laughs> after seeing 10 years of bullshit, but that, that didn't make me mad. That just gave me another thing to joke about. Uh, but, it, but I totally understood, like, who wants to hear this kind of sniping all the time? And, it, and it, I'm not talking about you because I, I know you're totally open-minded, 
but you have much stronger opinions, positive, negative, whatever, than a lot of writers, because you're not Johnny Katz. You're not always the same, you know, same note of, I'm just, I love the things where I know people and I know, you know, right. it, that's not you. So I'm dedicated and I'm the same to thing. It's kind of like if you're a question mark, then you're going to be less embraced because Vegas PRs, especially at the hotels, they are a certain kind of animal and they're, they have their little list. And you see, and the, the reason we know we this is we see, see the, the same, same players all over and the over. Time. And some of them have no audience at all. Some of the people come because of the food. In, in, in Vegas, <laughs> there, there's no lie there. They, there's no better invited. party than Cirque du Soleil's old parties that they used to throw for one to two million dollars. They would pay, and those I used to hang out with Guy Le Liberté back then at these parties, and they were incredible. But Perez, what's your take um, about what they're saying? And also, you got any dirt, anything going on that we want to talk about? <laughs> yeah, it's frustrating for me because I love Vegas. I'm a cheerleader of Vegas and I, I take a different approach. Like, you know, I went to see Awakening, for example, and I didn't like the show. I don't need to say I don't like the show. Instead, I said, I went to see Awakening and they have such an impressive stage. <laughs> The stage really blew me away. Look at this technology. So I'm being true to myself. Um, but, but you're what, not bashing it. Exactly. Because right. I don't want to do that. That's not who I am anymore. And also, but what's frustrating also is even if you amplify a story that somebody else broke, like the review journal may have written <laughs> about somebody doing this one thing or the hotel doing that one thing. If you even report on what the review journal is saying, people can get pissed at you, which is just shocking to me. Cause I'm like, well, I'll just talk about, I'm just, I'm just covering everything, but that doesn't mean I'm going to go trash your establishment or whatever. Um, it's been a learning process. Uh, I'm, I, my role here is to be a cheerleader of Vegas. That's how I really view myself. I'm not trying to be Scott. I'm not trying to be, Sam, I'm not trying to be anybody else. And I understand why people do what they do. I also believe that there's room enough at the table for everybody. You know, if you are good at what you do, do that. And don't try to knock anybody else down. Don't. What do you think about that, uh, uh, Scott? Well, I, I completely agree that, that you know, it, it's kind of what you said. Not everybody's going to love your show. It's not for everybody. I say the same thing about my Twitter account. If you don't like cancer jokes, you really are in for a big shock. But I think you earn you earn your audience. And so there's, you know, the awakening thing is a perfect example because I also didn't really love it when I first went to see it. I was reporting on you were doing a great job of showing like there's a lot of empty seats. He, he's the king of like, here's Facts. your proof. Here's your receipts. This show is not selling. It, this is not BS. It's not his opinion. So I wrote a story where I said, here's how you fix it. It's, it's not doing well. Here's how you fix it. And I, br I broke it down. They took that, and I was told by the people involved with the show, they said, we scrutinized that list and almost everything on your list we did. It's not because you said it, because of course they have to ask cover, <laughs> but uh, it's not because you gave us this list, but because we were already thinking about this stuff and we we implemented it. So in, in my world, that's more than taking a hit at something or a cheap shot. I want it to be better. And when I make fun of casino social media, which I do every day because it's terrible, I want it to be better. So that's not why I was making Chris Angel jokes, because you're as good as you could possibly be. Um, but in, in most cases, I'm, I'm giving feedback and I'm doing it in a snarky way. I was making Chris Angel jokes for me was just lazy lazy writing. And a lot of it had to do with what you're talking about. I got to do 50 tweets today. <laughs> I don't have that kind of mental 50? energy. I'm not that creative. Wow. I got to throw in a Chris Angel joke at some mm -hmm. point. But I'm also the same guy when people were saying his show sucks. I'm saying you haven't seen the show. You don't like his persona or his what, whatever. You don't like his tattoos or his hair, whatever you, the goth thing. You don't like that. It's not about going to see the show. And so I'm in there, I'm making a Chris Angel joke because it's, I figure you can take it, but I'm also saying, go see the show. This is not believe. 
This is and when a mystica was having its issues, I was like, he's not even in it. You're, you you can not say this is a, a Chris Angel thing. He's barely in it. And people don't realize how many people we employ and give jobs to, and they depend on us to put food on the table. Like I feel such a sense of responsibility, you know, uh, of, uh, and, and all of these shows and all of these, you know, the hotel and the industry, you know, is, is relying on, you know, tourists coming in, which let's face it this year, Vegas is down like, like what? 30%. It At is? least. Wow. It's flat. Well, it's flat. Um, yeah. It's, it, it's, it, it, it's the, not growing. The, the, yeah. the, the hotels. Well, I think a big problem is, you know, Vegas back in the day, not even that long ago, 10 years ago, eight years ago, it used to be a lot more affordable for your everyday tourist. Now. It's just gotten so expensive. Right. You know, we need to be sure luxury, but also budget conscious for folks and have and tre- cheap tickets, cheap hotel rooms available. But you know the problem, Perez, and I can tell you this as a producer, the problem is, is that everything has gotten more expensive. So all of the expendables that I use on my show have gone up by almost 20%, just the expendables, right? Uh, you have less people in town. Even though we're kicking ass compared to the other shows, we like all the other shows are down from a year ago. Um, so I think it's the economy. I think this election is people are waiting to see what happens. I also think it's the amount of attractions that are coming to Vegas, like F1, the Super Bowl, it, it, and the big, huge residencies. You know, when, when you have these big artists coming in and doing 10 shows or the Sphere, the U2 show, um, you know, it, there's only certain, so many hotel rooms, there's only so many dollars, you know? So the, the thing is, you know, F1, if you look at the top echelon hotels, they killed it. You look at the, the, the hotels that are at the bottom or in the middle, they got crushed. They lost their ass. And there's th- two more years of this going on. And the way that it impacts the city as far as trying to get around, trying to get to your job, trying to, you know, just navigate to the hotel. You have to, you have to leave a lot more time. Three Dude. months this year. Yeah, it's, Last year was nine months. This year, ooh, speeding it along <laughs> in just yeah, three so months. It's, it's not going to be three months. It's going to, it's going to be longer. <laughs> and it's a 10 year option. So, so I take it you're not a fan of F1 and Vegas. Listen, I, I had the, the, the pleasure of spending time, um, at McLaren, uh, with the, 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 the president, uh, and CEO, I, I, uh, Zach Brown, uh, and I was in the garage and I experienced it and it was amazing. It was amazing. But I got to tell you, honestly, the planning was piss poor. What was it piss poor about it? The fact that no one, it was chaotic. Like, am I taking off that week or am I performing that week? No one could give me an answer. No one could, well, you can perform, but you're going to have to move the time. What time am I supposed to move it? So what are you going to do? How do we get people there like that work at the show? Is there going to be a shuttle? Oh, we don't know. We'll get back to you. And by the way, it wasn't even Planet Hollywood's fault. It's like a much bigger situation. Could F1 be amazing for this town? Shit. Yeah, of course it can be great. Can the Super Bowl, can uh, another uh, 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 you know, professional major league baseball team be great? Of course it can be. The Golden Knights prove that you have camaraderie, you have, you know, the patriot- patriotism of our city, you're know, rooting for Vegas Knights to win the Stanley Cup. It's beautiful. It's a wonderful thing to have. But, you know, there's a lot of bureaucracy. And, um, you know, I know it firsthand for, from a lot of different experiences. I think people have the best intentions, but uh, what's the expression? Hell is paved in the best intentions. Mm -hmm. And, and that's the problem. It's all about the execution. And I find when people don't own their business, when you're not responsible to put food on your own table and the people that work with you, then you're collecting a salary and you don't have to be as passionate or as responsible 
and as concerned as you do when you do. So you're a producer of your show, the yeah. producer of your show. What are your plans for F1 week oh, this year? I'm not year? performing. Of course not. How it do I killed, perform? Planet everyone. Hollywood is surrounded by a track on two sides. So how does the cast, the crew, or somebody that wants to come over that's staying in another hotel come see the show? You can't do it. It's impossible. So, so we're, but at least now, better than last year, we know about this. So when we publish the calendar for ticket sales, we don't put that week on. So uh, there's 40 other weeks to pick from for this year. Last year, we had that as part of a performing week. And then we realized that, uh, that we, we had to cancel it, just like all the other shows had to cancel. It's um, great hearing that from the horse's mouth because it was really hard to get anybody to speak up about it till kind of after the fact. And the casinos are still kind of how ha- they know they got hit. It's like you said, it, 95% of the casinos were down businesses, restaurants, it like overall, not just for that week or that month, but for, for all those months, the rooms were down and, and they blame me. <laughs> they, they literally called me a, a very high ranking CEO of one of the biggest gaming companies in the world when calls me <laughs> and says, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at some improvements because we realize this was kind of a have and have not situation. The show's kind of were affected. I'm like, kind of affected. It, it's yeah. millions of I, dollars. I, I, I lost a lot of money in that one week. Here's the sentiment, because I had the pleasure of talking to the president of a huge conglomerate of hotels. And he said exactly that. It was successful for the top echelon. And the middle and the bottom got crushed, but we're changing at this year. And I think for the locals, they got crushed. You know, when you can't go in and out of a business or you can't get to work or you're so inconvenient. But listen, the great news is I think we've had the experience. I think everybody is taking it seriously. And I think everybody is planning for this year with the knowledge that they have from last and with the desire to make it a smooth event, which I think it can be. And hopefully it is, but, um, but yeah, it, 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 uh, I know shows that had to be closed for not a week, but weeks yep. because it was such a hindrance to get to the location. They want me to shut up. Yeah. Basically, they want the critics of F1 to be quiet. That's basically what they're asking because they have that same hope. I just don't know how you do it. Because yeah. the only solution they've had is let's have cheap tickets for locals. Like that's somehow going to make the fact that they can't get to work at Planet Hollywood for night for I, however I many think, months. I it think is. that there probably will um, have more people. Uh, a, a, a more planned out schedule. I think the execution is going to be better. I, I believe that, I believe that the, the folks that have the hotels and, and, and run the hotels are going to want to do the right thing. And, and let me just say, F1 was insanely exciting to be experiencing that. And, and thanks to Zach for giving me that opportunity, which I was in a very unique situation. It can be a blast for people. Now, same thing with the Super Bowl. I wasn't at the Super Bowl, but the excitement of having a Super Bowl in Vegas and I think how it could impact our city um, in a positive way, it's all there. It's just all about the execution and how you, and how you put that together. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm excited. Uh, Las Vegas is, has been such an amazing place um, for me and my family. And uh, uh, this city is really, truly the entertainment capital of the world. It has transformed entertainment. There's things in Vegas that you could never, ever see anywhere else in the world. And I love this place. I was going to originally move back to New York after my contract was done over at Luxor. And I was like, no way. I'm, I live here. I, I, my whole life is here now. And uh, the people here, by and large, are awesome. Uh, the workers, they're, they're, they're second to none. Everybody 
feels this sense of camaraderie. And I really feel it with the families that have children that are sick or make a wish or cure for the kids or St. Baldrick's or any of these places. It's, it's a really strong community. People are here to help each other. You know, when we had that Vegas shooting, that was horrific. I think that everybody came together. So it's a, it's, it's a wonderful, unique place to live. And, um, you know, things can always be better. And it only matters that we try to become better as a community, individually. And, and, and I think if we all do our part and try to be better, um, I think it will be better. And, and that's part of the reason why I really wanted you um, to be here, to, to just kind of talk and express our thoughts and let people see the different perspectives and, and, and uh, let them come away with their own opinion. But I am very grateful to each of you, Sam. Uh, thank you. Vegas 411 is the place to check out all of your, your blogs and what you put out there and obviously your Instagram and, 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 um, X is what? Um, it's, um, we have a Vegas 411. Okay. Awesome. There. Uh, awesome. And then obviously Scott, where can people find you? Uh, on Twitter, it's at vital Vegas. Uh, you can go to vitalvegas.com. It's on casino.org. Uh, it's all the other platforms too. It usually has the word vital and Vegas together. There you go. And Perez. Well, if you enjoyed me here, I have my own podcast, PerezPodcast.com. Uh, to keep informed on everything, of course, PerezHilton.com. And that's on socials everywhere. And my Vegas Instagram account is Las Vegas Perez. I have an immense feeling of gratitude to be able to live here. I love this city. I love the people. I love you. I love you too. I love you all. Because <laughs> I love, I love you, you all. Yeah, you got to put too. love, light, and positivity in role because that's, you are a product of your environment. So if you put it out there, it comes back to you. And uh, I, I think it's really important. Uh, guys, thank you so very much for your time, for your consideration. And uh, uh, hopefully this is uh, the start of many things to come. Who knows what? But, uh, but you never know what can happen you next. You never know. <laughs> and and as you, what you said, uh, Scott, everything is ruined permanently <laughs> in a positive, beautiful way. So if you have somebody right now that you have a beef with, that you're upset with, maybe somebody in your family, maybe if an old friend of yours, you know, I had a beef with this guy, Mateo, that was in my show for years. We didn't talk and he reached out to me and now we reunited. And it's such a beautiful thing. You know, life is about that change and transformation and it's never too late. So if you haven't talked to somebody in a while, put your ego to the side and uh, pick up the phone and, and or maybe do a little text and reach out to that person. Because at the end of the day, when you're laying on your deathbed, all the bullshit is going to mean nothing. What matters are the things you can't buy. And that's friendship, love, positivity, and light. And I also want to thank our incredible sponsor. If you want the best in the business when it comes to microphones, be sure, get sure. Thanks for watching. Till next time, Talking Junkie. This is Chris Angel's Talking Junkies.